Hello and welcome to office hours at Cabo San Lucas. The sun just went down behind me. Uh, you'll see a few sunset cruises going around back and forth, boats that uh, watch the sun go down, watch the whales come around. There are a lot of whales coming through the southern tip or coming around the southern tip of the Baja Peninsula this time of year. It's uh, mid-December, so there are a lot of whales that come down from Alaska. And during the day, you can see them jumping uh, up above the water, which is really cool to watch. I have a zoom lens with me. Uh, one of these days, I'll do an office hours just talking while the, way, while the whales are jumping over, and I'll be zooming in and looking at them with the cameras. But not today. Today, we will just go through your questions. So the number one highest voted one is from Alexander. Alexander asks, how do I determine how much memory is being used by query store? Whenever I want to find out how much memory is being used by something, the place that I start is sys.dm underscore os underscore memory underscore clerks. Sysdm os memory clerks. Having said that, and so you've, in there you can sort by pages, KB descending, and it'll tell you which parts of SQL Server, which internal parts are using the most memory. Um, but having said that, what are you actually going to do about it? If your answer is, query store is using too much memory, I'm going to turn it off. I don't think you're going to find any other monitoring tool that does what Query Store does while using less memory. Like the amount of memory that's been used by Query Store has never been the thing where I said, oh, that, that's not going to work. Um, the, there are issues with Query Store around unparameterized plans, but I question what action you're going to take based on that information. And this also kind of smells a little bit like either you think you found a memory leak, in which case just open up a support case with Microsoft. Um, or uh, if you're worried about it from a performance perspective, this smells like a micromanaging of somebody who's only got like 16 gigs of RAM. Next up we have A. Aslan asks, Merhaba Brent, I don't know what that means. In your opinion, what are the top four databases to administer by DBA pay scale? You know, I have absolutely no idea, but that's why we, part of why we do the salary survey every year. If you go to brentozar.com slash go slash salary, I run a salary survey on the blog. Now keep in mind that my audience is mostly Microsoft SQL Server professionals. So you're going to get skewed answers based on that. However, having said that, it's a, it's a good place to start if you want data. Um, again, too, you know, it's funny. I, I, I go, what, what uh, decision are you going to make based on that information? Are you going to change the database you manage based on the pay scale? Because here's the thing. When you change databases, you're a junior DBA now. If you have five to 10 years of experience with, say, SQL Server, and Acme Database makes more uh, for their senior database administrators, how long is it going to take you to be senior on Acme Databases in order to justify that payoff jump? Um, so just be really careful to jump ship because you're probably going to make less in the short term. And everything's a gamble, right? Like that just because a database is highly paid today doesn't mean it's gonna be highly paid a couple few years from now because these things are so cyclical. I've seen cases, uh, for example, the MongoDB market was on fire for a while just because a lot of development shops, and I say a lot and that's kind of tricky, a lot of development shops um, started doing uh, MongoDB in production and then realized, oh snap, wait a minute, we actually need people to administer it for us. So temporarily, there was a really big, huge crunch on MongoDB administrators, and it's probably like that with every database platform temporarily. Next up, we have Murdoch. Murdoch says, in a two-node, synchronous, always-on availability group, should my friends let reports read from the primary or the secondary? 
the first thing that I always get nervous about anytime we talk about reading from a synchronous AG, the reason you have a synchronous AG is so you can do automatic failover, looks like rock'em sock'em robots, you can do automatic failover between the primary and the secondary. Well, when you add workloads to the secondary, you can slow down transactions on the primary. So let me just paint a temporary picture here for a second. We offloaded reports from the primary to the secondary because it was just too much workload when it was all on the primary. There was too much workload, so we decided to put some of the workload on the secondary. Well, if you had too much workload for one server and now your work requires two, you have two single points of failure because now the secondary by itself won't be enough to keep up. And sometimes people are like, well, yeah, but we just, we just want to take some load off the primary. Ah, if you can't survive on one, then you need more than two if you want automatic failover. Plus, my usual just rule of thumb is if you have a synchronous secondary for reporting purposes, that's free with the current, uh, current licensing of SQL Server since 2019 came out. Uh, every primary that's licensed under Software Assurance gets one free local license for high availability and one free disaster recovery license. But you can't query them. As soon as you start querying them, you have to pay for their licensing. So, and because usually the expensive part is the licensing anyway. So if you have so much workload that you want to offload reports somewhere, put those on an async secondary, but don't jeopardize your primary's transactions or your failover capability by using that standby extra free secondary, because as soon as you start querying it, it's no longer free. Next, I should have more sips of my tasty beverage. Ah, refrescante. Next up, we have Tobias. Tobias Funk, or Funky, says, Howdy, Brent. We see a lot of duplicate query plans due to queries using literal values instead of parameterized values in the where condition. Are there any potential gotchas associated with enabling forced parameterization in this scenario? The short answer is yes. You are enabling parameter sniffing because now you're going to get one execution plan that's reused across all of those instead of multiples. The long answer is covered in the parameterization section of my mastering server tuning class. But as long as you get that you're enabling uh, parameter sniffing, then that may be enough for you that you go, oh, okay, maybe this isn't a good idea or that it's a good idea on my servers. Next up, Ann Young asks, Hello, Brent. We have an ISV app for which we made our own non-clustered indexes to help with speed for our custom reports. Unfortunately, this broke the next major upgrade script for that application and database. Yep. What are your thoughts on applying non-clustered indexes to application databases? If you're going to do it, you have to keep a log of which indexes you added. And every time you either call the vendor for maintenance or you do an upgrade, you have to temporarily drop those indexes and then recreate them when that situation is over. But that is up to you. You broke it, you bought it. The tool that will help is when you name your indexes, name them with your company name. Like, let's say you work for Acme Industries, you name your indexes Acme underscore and then whatever the columns are. So that way you can rapidly go check to see which indexes start with Acme and then drop those. A tool that will help is SP Blitz Index Mode 2. If you run SP Blitz Index mode equals two, it gives you all of the indexes in the database, and then that way you can sort them by name, and then you can real rapidly pluck out the just the indexes that have your company's name at the beginning of the prefix. And if you scroll across to the right, 
I'm not sure which direction that is for you. I guess that's this way. Um, if you scroll across to the right uh, in that SP Blitz Index Mode 2 output, you will see drop index commands and create index commands just to make that part of your job so much easier. Next up, Buster says, Hello, Brent. From a hiring perspective, oh, what are the traits that distinguish a junior SQL DBA from a senior SQL DBA? Oh, that's a great question. My clients have asked me that when they're posting stuff. And the way that I give them the answer is, if you want someone who's doing most of their tasks for the first time, and they're using Google to accomplish those tasks, that's a more junior version of any role. If, when you hire someone, you want to sit them down into a in front of a computer and you want to know that they've done their job before, they've done most of the parts of their job before. Sure, we all hit edge cases where we have to Google in order to find fixes, but if you want most of the things that they hit on a day-to-day -day basis that they've already done before, that's a senior, so that helps people understand. Like, well, doesn't everybody Google everything? We all Google some stuff, but the junior is Googling everything. The senior DBA is Googling less of the stuff. And then we'll do one more question. Uh, Adam says, hi, Brent. Is it possible, safe, or wise to offload backups and check DB to an availability group secondary server? Is it possible? Yes. Is it safe? Nah, here's the thing. Replication can break. Availability group replication can break, and if you're doing your transaction log backups on a replica that's out of sync, you're not really backing up anything. I have had instances where clients offloaded their full and log backups to a replica, availability group replication broke, and within a matter of minutes or hours, the primary went down. Because when SQL Server goes to hell in a handbasket, things will gradually start to fall off the side. One of the things that may fall off the side is your availability group replication. You don't want to be in a situation where the primary has the only source of truth for some of the data, and you're, therefore you're having to resuscitate the primary first before you're able to do anything else. This is even true if you have synchronous replication. Uh, SQL Server's availability group synchronous replication will automatically degrade down to async. Since SQL Server 2017, we've had an, an option called minimum replica commit or something like that, minimum commit replica, where you can say if a transaction doesn't commit against at least a certain number of replicas, then the transaction is discarded. This mitigates that problem, but the problem is that it's also kind of slow mode because now your transactions won't commit until you get enough of a quorum and that, that can slow down your inserts, updates, or deletes. So because of that, the way that I'd say it is, I'm okay with you offloading fulls. I am not okay with you offloading log backups. The log backups gotta be taken on the primary the fulls, sure, take those from wherever, because if you have a full that fails uh, or that backs up out of sync data, that's not that big of a deal. You can go to the prior full and apply all the log since, as long as the log was taken on the primary or something that didn't lose any data. All right, well, that wraps up an office hours. You see uh, the boats uh, slowly coming back in here. People are peeling in off the beach. Uh, now that the sun is down, let's see, it's about 6 p.m. here. And uh, this, I, you know, when I, I talked about uh, gradually retiring onto this beach, this is the beach where the uh, little baby sea turtles uh, are like their mamas come in and lay eggs all along this beach. We're at the end of December, or the middle, middle to end of December, and so this is the end of the egg hatching season as well. Now, every morning I walk up and down this beach looking for little baby sea turtles to make sure that they made it to, to the ocean. Because as the sun rises, the birds start to come over here 
and they'll pick off any uh, sea turtles that didn't make it to the ocean and uh, eat them. <laughs> And as much as I'd like to let nature take, take its own course, sea turtles are pretty adorable, so I don't mind helping those uh, off to the ocean. I have not found a single one this season, because I kind of got here late. I got here uh, in, uh, early in December, um, which is really when the season starts to end for hatching. Uh, and then the, most of the hatching happens September, October, November, December. Um, so I'm really looking forward to in 2022 coming back here and uh, being here the whole hatching season and patrolling the whole entire time. Uh, my parents, my dad's coming down on Tuesday to uh, hang out with me and see this beach, which will be a lot of fun because um, I first introduced him and his side of the family to this beach uh, a few years ago, a few years back. And it's really fun to come back to the same area now that I'm a homeowner on the beach and I can actually uh, say, here, come crash at my place, which will be kind of fun. You see how empty the beach is? This is almost always like this. This is not a swimmable beach. The currents are so strong here uh, that you're not allowed to swim. And every year a couple few people die because they, they try to swim and the currents just pick them up and take them right out, out and away. Um, but there's, there's another swimmable beach over like a 10 minute walk over that way. Uh, but because I don't swim in the ocean anyway, that's why the good Lord invented pools. Uh, because I don't swim in the ocean anyway. This is my idea of a good time. And because it's so deep, and because the water's so deep here, uh, you, the boats can uh, come in right on shore, or come in right alongside the shore. And uh, uh, it's kind of neat to see all the little dinner cruises and night cruises and things like that go by. Well, that is it for today. I will go make myself another tasty beverage, and I will see y'all on the next Office Hours. Adios.